All right. So we're starting with Liz. Uh, yeah, they expect 5G conspiracy. Is that for real? It is. I mean, I learned about this uh, earlier in the year from one of my students who asked me uh, completely straight based in class uh, about this, um, and about the dangers of 5G. And I, uh, I, I was dumbfounded for a second because I didn't even realize this was a thing, but it's a thing. And I knew they were burning cell phone towers down in um, Britain over this. Uh, but I did not realize until um, yesterday when the story came out that uh, that uh, it's actually uh, the intelligence agencies think that this might be the possible um, potential motive for uh, the uh, suicide bombing that happened in um, Nashville on Christmas. Tennessee is the hotbed of anti five G. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't realize that until this story came out, which is pretty crazy. Um, so remind me again why people hate 5G when they have 4G right now. Because we've gone through for, five, four generations of this and we haven't had an upheaval of this. For some reason, they think that somehow uh, the 5G can... Uh, make you susceptible to COVID. They say it there. The, it suppresses the, the immune uh, system. Yeah, um, and, and there was one, some of the conspiracy theories um, dovetailed with like, oh, uh, they're rolling this out now because it spreads COVID, uh, which is, as we know, absurd. Um, you know, when I was a lad, they just blamed everything on witches. I mean. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Now that we're talking about that, it's hitting me that we have this, Kind of thinking, why didn't people freak, or why aren't people freaking out over 6G? I can see that being thrown around because 666. And then they probably will when it gets here. Yeah, I'm sure. Why, it, like 5G, just like what? You have 4G, calm down. It, it's crazy all the way down, but it's especially crazy because we don't even have 5G in this country. It's not even a thing. Our infrastructure doesn't even support it. It's just a marketing buzzword. Right. You don't you don't even get 4G LTE everywhere. Yeah, I'm I, you know, there are plenty of crazy, super crazy uh conspiracy oh. theories out there, but um this is uh this one's extra. I, I would love to know um you know just from an urban folklore perspective where and how this originated oh. in the first place. Me too. Well, I see the Russians involved in promoting it, which makes sense. Sure, yeah, exploit any weakness. Yeah, so and yeah, it's of well. course good for them if we burn down our own telecoms. But you know, the thing that surprised me about the Nashville bomber is that he didn't like put out a manifesto or even a web page or a poster or something. If you're going to do something for some kind of political reason, you would normally advertise the reason. You would think, you would think, but who knows? Maybe he did and we just don't know about it. Um, hard to tell. I mean, it's just such a bizarre, the whole thing is just so bizarre. It is very bizarre. Really doesn't make a lot of sense. And I, I mean, I'm certainly curious about what's behind all this. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the immediate interest, I think, of everybody is, is he part of some group? Are there going to be more like this? And apparently not. Well, the uh, I, the intelligence agencies are, are saying, like, be on the lookout and don't be surprised if there are more because they've been um, monitoring social media feeds and stuff like that, various, you know, extremist outlets, um, websites and what have you. And uh, this is a pretty, apparently a pretty big movement of weirdos that are saying this. So, yeah. Um, Bristling you know, Badger Brigade. Wow. Well, that's a new one. <laughs> yeah, I've, I had not heard of the uh, Triple B yet. Um, and and I mean, geez, like the last thing we need is for people to be destroying our already crappy uh, telecom <laughs> infrastructure in this country. I mean, as we saw, uh, you know, Irvin's going to talk about this a little bit more. But we're already not in a very good place as far as that's concerned. We're way behind, way behind on our uh, telecom infrastructure. And um, 
No, uh, at, we're moving it backwards is not a good thing. Yeah, the one thing I notice is how much education is utterly failing in America. We have a huge rise in people that just believe garbage and don't trust reliable sources anymore. Uh, what this was not supposed to happen with all the internet and everything, when people have access to accurate information. No, it's weird. Yeah, it's a, weird, it's it. like a weirdly medieval trend back to, uh, you know, it's just. Which is the leeches and. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, but in retrospect, I think I remember it's like if you give them a, smart, a, a, a grocery store full of every kind of food, a bunch of them will buy nothing but the junk food. So it's the same thing on the internet. They hunt this stuff up to watch instead of like watching boring news that's actually full of facts or something. I, I mean, the thing that's surprising is that this person was supposedly a, a tech person, a, a computer geek. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's I get the the person from Podunk, you know, Illinois, who has trouble turning on their MacBook or whatever, and is like, 5G, that sounds scary. But this person supposedly knew a bit about technology and should have the <laughs> wherewithal to know that, um, you know, radio waves don't, don't cause COVID. It might be a case of a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing too, in that, uh, their knowledge was in a, a different domain or um, they are, uh, and they also could have, could have and probably were totally crazy. Um, you'd have to be to do that. So, I mean, it could be a situation like that. It, it is just very bizarre. And I think it's weird that, you know, first off, I think it's weird that this isn't being referred to as a terrorist attack or a yes. suicide bombing because yeah. that's what this was in every sense. So, yeah. Well, it's absolutely a suicide bombing. You can't argue that. I, I've been somewhat unclear about the terrorism because terrorism kind of has to have a cause. And it hasn't been clear to me that there's any cause, but it's certainly a suicide bombing. Right. If, if it is for some cause like 5G, then I think it totally is terrorism. Yeah. Well, we're, they're not, they're shying, they're not even calling it a suicide bombing either, which is weird, really weird to me. I wonder. Mm -hmm. if that seems like the most simple, perfect description of what it is. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It, it's, and, and it makes you wonder like what we're being told and what we're not being told about it. So it's, it's hard to yeah. have any idea what's going on. I, I hope that there are no more of these. Um, can well, I, uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Can I make a quick assumption? Um, is it safe to assume that that based on your comments that the uh, suicide bomber was a white male? Yes, he was. Okay. <laughs> yep. He was there actually. He was actually. He was like sixty years old. He was just sort of like your average looking, you know, tech, like right. TV repair, radio repair kind of guy. <laughs> Which is probably why it's not being referred to as a suicide bombing because we all have a. Con uh, a fairly narrow conception of what that looks like. Yeah, but but I mean, he absolutely did commit suicide in order to blow that thing up, and it's a mighty screwy thing to do. Anyway, but this is this is certainly the case. We have anti-vaxxers, MAGA supporters, and anti-5G just disinformation. These cults of anti-truth are really big now. Yeah, and and seemingly, I mean, it's it's kind of crazy how strong of a hold they have on people. It's like the cult of disinformation. Yeah, we talked about it last time. I mean, I do understand that. I've been in cults. I mean, they become your family. They become the center of your life. You you get reinforced. And the crazier they are, the more strongly you cling together because now you're isolated from the rest of the world. And you're it doesn't small... help. Yeah, I mean, and it doesn't help that our government has lied to people consistently. I mean, yeah. even this year. So... I can kind of see how this might happen because the government and the media do lie regularly. Yeah. So especially for somebody who might like be on the edge with some mental health issues or um, you know maybe even just social issues or, or a combination of those, I could see how this stuff could take hold. Yeah, that's the that's I think part of the fuel for the paranoid stuff. And another one I've heard a lot about is the black community is quite in general resistant to taking the the vaccine with very good reason because there's a long history of them doing medical experiments on black people by giving them fake medicine in America to where their their distrust of the medical system is high 
and it's not because they're crazy. There's a yeah. real problem. <laughs> yes, and I, it's funny because I was just talking to a uh, black friend of mine about this the other day, and she said, you know, um, because cause she was like asking me about it, how do you feel about this? And, and we, we had a discussion about it, and she said, you know, at first, um, the message was, was that uh, black and brown people should get the vaccine first because we're more prone. And she was like, you know, when I heard that, I'm, uh, the, my first response was hell no, because there's, there's not a good history there with my people. Uh, yeah. But then uh, it started to come to the point where I'm seeing, um, you know, rich people cutting the line and, and trying to, trying to get it first and, and stuff like that. And then that kind of tempered that a little bit for her because she's like, well, if they're, um, you know, shoving people out of the way to get to it first and, and paying extra money and all this stuff, then, you know, maybe it's okay. But I can, I can absolutely see why there would be resistance to it in that community, especially when there was messaging early on, like, hey, we should try this out on black and brown folks first. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Terrible, you know, what are you going to yeah. do? Yeah. Now let's take a look at Irvin's one here, which is the, which uh, dovetails into Liz's yeah. first. Yeah. Um, this map, I don't know if this map is up to date. Might not be anymore. Uh, but not too long ago, it was showing just how widespread across the nation that one attack did on us and why we really shouldn't be tearing down our infrastructure because yeah if one one hit in Tennessee affected even San Francisco and LA you know what's to say a second will bring down most of the nation is it because Nashville is like a central station or something it is yeah 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 oh there you go yeah it's like a yeah. nuclear bomb hit this is yeah. like a nine, and 9 11 was the same right the 9 11 tower was a huge hub of communication mm -hmm. yep yep so same um, yeah, we really shouldn't be tearing down our infrastructure. We're trying to uh, build it up, and yeah, anti-5G is not helping. Well, you know, what my first thought, of course, when I saw that is maybe this will be followed by another attack from an enemy nation. I mean, that, that's the point of this. You make you create a vulnerability by doing this, but apparently it's just one lone crazy guy, not part of some group that's got a plan. Although a nation, uh, you know, an enemy nation can now see this and go, oh, that's all we need to do. We don't need to do this massive attack. We don't have to, you know, plan these intricacy things like in World War II. We just hit a, a one of these central hubs, and that'll affect quite that'll affect the, the nation. Well, it will, but this is one issue about uh, cyber attacks. They're like air attacks. You cannot win territory. All you can do is weaken defenses temporarily, and then you have to actually invade with troops and take the land, uh, or right. or they just fix it, and it doesn't really hurt them very much in the long run. Well, it's pretty crazy too that our, you know, a lot of this is 911 emergency services that are disrupted. And I mean, just from one uh, essentially like main node being taken out, uh, there were this far of ramifications. And, you know, this I would say is just another, I haven't heard much any of anyone talking about this yet, but to me, one of my first thoughts is this is another indicator why telecom monopolies are a really bad thing because you're not going to achieve any um, infrastructure redundancy or a strong infrastructure when you've got one or two companies running the whole show. You know, I thought the whole point of the internet was that there were many routes to get from A to B. So if you blew up one place, it wouldn't shut down very much. Apparently that's not true. It probably was at the beginning and then just like telecom, the telecom company, they, they just swooped up all the all the entry points and, and now we have a few. Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's uh, interesting to know. A lot of surprising stuff. That's why you have to really test things because uh, the difference between theory and reality is often pretty large. So this was surprising. Um, Someone ran a phishing campaign uh, hosted on a GitHub page, saying, "You know, oh, if you sign up with with Facebook, you'll you'll get uh, this cell phone offer, free data. It'll be great." And a bunch of people just fell for it, put in their Facebook credentials, and I think at one point, I think the article says like a hundred people a minute were throwing in their. <laughs> 
giving them their credentials. And wow. they ended up getting um, uh, six, 615,000 Facebook credentials off this one attack. Uh, it's ridiculous. Um, and, and of what, course- What do you do with those? Are they worth money somehow? They must be. I mean, if, at the very least, you can probably do some credential stuffing. Even if Facebook itself isn't very lucrative, you can you know, use it to get into their other accounts. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, it says, yeah, over 100 entries per minute. Per minute. Most yeah. of it are coming from overseas. So this was not targeting the United States. This was mostly uh, Nepal, you know, the Philippines, Pakistan, those places. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, this was ridiculously successful. I have no idea how you get 100 people a minute. Uh, and you know, Facebook wants to be money with Libra. Yeah. They aren't, they aren't yet, but if they were your bank, then I would understand this a little more. Yeah, no, they're not. It's, it's people just, somebody wanted some Facebook creds and just this phishing campaign just went, went. Successful, scary. Yeah. yeah, no, I've, I've never seen a phishing campaign successful before, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Facebook uh, credentials must be worth some money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then this I thought was wonderful. This woman, Rachel Thomas, is local from University of San Francisco, and I didn't know about her, but she is very interesting. Um, she teaches ethics. Welcome to lesson. And this is wonderful stuff. Um, she, she broke her videos up in little chunks so you can see them. And so she starts with this stuff, you know, why do you care about ethics and technology? Just a few articles from this year, right? Um, all these crazy things have happened. And she's teaching like what you do. So you, when you plan something like a social network or a, a algorithm to pick what YouTube video to show you next, you have to think about it. And then here's this woman named Chanya Sweeney was a PhD at Harvard. And when she Googled her name, all the ads say, has she been arrested? How about her criminal record and stuff? And she's never been arrested. And there's nobody else named Chanya Sweeney that ever got arrested. So she tried Googling other random names and that doesn't happen unless your name looks black. For people with common black names, it just assumes you're trying to find a criminal record. For white people, they assume you're trying to do something harmless. And she said, hey, this is messed up. And she points out there's just a lot of these things, like say Facebook's ad system, facial recognition. And uh, here's um, the head of IBM meeting with Hitler to help plan the computerizing of the death camps so they could organize killing people and keeping track of which ones they killed. And I, she didn't mention it, but I know IBM was also deeply involved in South Africa. They made the registration system that would give you all these identity cards that would sort what race you are. And then they'd have these, you, if you're a certain race, you're only allowed to go to certain regions of the country and they can arrest you for being out of your zone. And IBM totally cooperated with all that. So she said, I thought this is very good. And how would you feel if what you built turned out to be something horrible like that? And she has like practical plans, how to test things sensible ideas, what you can do. She says, what you have to do is think about abuse, build a system where there is some way to appeal. If somebody says, hey, your system is doing something horrible, there ought to be some way of appealing that you think about when you design your system. So anyway, I was very interested. I think it's great stuff. I'm hoping we can get her as like guest speaker in our classes next semester or something. Because uh, as a lot of, I heard she has somebody commenting during this lecture and they're saying, you know, I thought ethics was like meaningless philosophy. It didn't really have any application. She said, well, I'm keeping it practical, how you really use it. And I said, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not some philosophical thing. It's like, how do we actually accomplish ethics when we're designing a product? I, I, I totally agree. Uh, philosophy is totally applicable to technology, to, um, to engineering. You know, it's not just, uh, you know, um, abstract questions about the meaning of life. I mean, the, the philosophy teaches you how to think. And to that sense, you know, how do you solve these problems? Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if philosophy is required for if you are going into any sort of STEM field, but it absolutely should be. Well, I mean, so, it would have uh, to be this kind of applied philosophy so you don't yeah. lose people. It can't just be like, theoretical stuff, it has to be connected to like, how can I include this in my homework? Yeah, I mean, I but you, you, you still need to teach people, you know, basic logical fallacies, um, you know, the, the basic stuff before you get into um, ethics in, in applying ethics and technology though.
Well, well, this, I think, is why you need great teachers. And she's one of them. I remember there are people who can take something that people can't connect to that just seems like meaningless and abstract, and they can make it clear to you how this is useful. And she can do it. And, you know, most people can't. Most people teaching philosophy cannot reach you with how this actually applies to your life. I mean, so I oh. go ahead. Go ahead. Were you going to say, Caitlin? After you. Oh, um, I, I so one of the issues that I've run into is that you sometimes have just like seemingly like morally bankrupt people. Like I, I've encountered this with students, and I've also encountered it with um, friends and acquaintances. Like I, I used to work with a sort of an ex friend who. Um, not because of this, but other things, but we, we used to work together and, and he got excited because he was going to work for Palantir and they were going to pay him a boatload of money. And I'm like, oh, how can you work there? They do all these horrific and evil things. And he's like, well, like what? And I, you know, started kind of enumerating the list and he's like, you know, Liz, some people just care about the money. And that's all I care about is the money because it pays good. And I'm just like, okay. I mean, that's, that's a thing and it's true i mean there are a lot of engineers that build these things that really could care less about the ethical implications of what they're building they just care about getting paid a boatload of money well i must say a generation ago that was the official recommendation of economists that was the plan the business of business is business all you should do is make money and the invisible hand of adam smith will take care of the rest it's a but you know we're moving away from that we're moving sort of beyond it well, what do you do when you have students that come in that are just like completely ethically bankrupt? Like they don't even want to learn. They don't care. They just care about making money. Well, you know, I wouldn't even touch it. This is what they say about Biden. I just heard an interview with Biden compared to Obama. And they said, the reason why Republicans like Biden is when he meets with you, he says, okay, here's what I want. He doesn't yell at you and say, you shouldn't want that. He just says, well, okay, let's figure out how I can get what I want. You can get what you want. We can make a deal here. Whereas Obama would get self-righteous and say, you shouldn't want that. You should want something else. And they said, that doesn't do me any good. This is what I want. This is what I can't campaign on. I don't want you to tell me to not be what I am. I want to figure out how to get, get what I'm going for. So I, you know, I think that's where I would be. I would just um, not even go there. I mean, if, if students aren't interested, I, I don't try to ram it down their throat, you know, but I think if you present it the right way, some of them will become interested. They'll say, oh, you know, now I see there's some, you can't see, it can't affect them all though, you know, but I think, I, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, it is really weird that we don't focus at least somewhat on philosophy when teaching uh, any of the scientific fields, because science itself is a philosophy. You need to make the connection, and this is the first time I've seen it. I, I'm all for it, if you, but you have to tie it into the program in a, in a way that, that reaches people. Anyway, so I, I'm hoping I can get her in for a guest speaker and we can hear more from her, and then maybe we could integrate more of this. Anyway, these videos are a good contribution. And uh, anyway, that's why I thought that was good. So now the best tech employer of the year. Well, there you go. Yeah, so I thought I had heard all of the, um, I thought I'd heard all the scams out there. I thought I'd heard every, every last bit of um, body shop scams, consulting firm scams, but no, there's more. Um, and this one was pretty gross. Uh, I don't know, I've, have I frozen up? Because you're all frozen up. Me? No, nope, okay. well, I'm, okay. I'm okay, I'm alive. Okay, great. Um, so this company, um, and this this reminds this reminded me of some stories, um, some other stories, which I'll touch on in a second. But uh, this mega consulting corp in the UK has this nice little scam going on, where um, they uh, they train their employees, they train their the new hires. Um, to uh, which is unpaid, unpaid training um, for three months, um, and then after the three months, uh, their salaries um, their salaries kick in. Now this unpaid training, they didn't talk too much about it in the article, 
uh, but um, they had to the the um, the trainee, the new hire, had to work for um, uh, I want to say it was three years, two years with the company, um, and if they quit before then, the company holds them liable for paying back uh, 22,000 pounds, which is somewhere around 30 grand, 30,000 US dollars for paying this back. And that's like basically what they get paid per year, entire year in a salary too. So um, this guy left to take care of his sick mom um, and they tried to stick him uh, for the full cost of this uh, quote unquote training that was unpaid. Yep. So I, I thought I'd heard every body shop scam there was, but this was a new one. Wow. So did he have to pay it or is it still going through court or what? Uh, I believe that, um, I believe that it's still going through court. It was unlawful. See, because this is actually the first uh, lawsuit that I was involved in when I worked in fraud restitution was a company like this that would charge you for terminating a lease early. And that also did not hold up in court <laughs> where you get nothing at all and you have to pay for that privilege. <laughs> That's what Comcast does to uh, small business subscribers. They force you into a contract where it doesn't matter if your business shuts down or if you move um, or anything like that. If you have, if your business shuts down um, six months into this mandatory one-year contract, you're on the hook for paying their extortionate fees for the rest of that year in exchange for getting nothing. Yeah, those things are quite common. This one here, what would happen is you'd lease a car and if you were late on a payment, they would impound the car, but you still have to keep paying as if you still had the car. And that I think could be legal, but they would have had to make it more clear in the contract. That's crazy. It is, you know. Stuff like that ought to be illegal. Yeah. It ought to be, yeah. It ought to be. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, that's that's pretty gruesome stuff. And rainbow tables. Hey, this is, it took you a month, right? It took me a whole month to do this in the process of running the the uh, com the regionals. Uh, we use this as part of the regional contest. We uh, oh. allow teams to use it. But I'm actually finally done creating these tables. Uh, so the big process is I downloaded uh, RTI two tables from Infocon. Uh -huh. And that was about nine terabytes worth of, of tables. But those tables are useless on the new Rainbow Table, the Project Rainbow Table uh, software. Because mm -hmm. the, the, the free Rainbow Table software that they have hasn't been updated since like 2013 or something. So the new one doesn't run on that. So you have to convert it. You have to first take that RTI2, turn it into the, the more common RT. And that's, that's where things grow like 250%. And then from there, you convert it into RTC so that it's, more, it's smaller and it's usable with the, with the new software. In the end, I got 11.3 terabytes. And what's so now I can run it. And what kind of processor have you got running this? Oh, I have a, a Intel Nook being the, the uh, virtual machine that's running this. So uh, all the all the tables I have on a NAS, that um, uh, Synology NAS. Yeah, and you, you ran this one process for a month? And yeah, yeah, taking the tables, converting them into RT, reconverting them into RTC and getting rid of the old ones. Yeah, it took you know, a month to get through the nine terabytes. Well, you know, I would assume that if I started something that was going to take a month, it would crash after 24 hours and corrupt the disk and never finish. I would assume you have to break it up into little chunks at least. Uh, I, I broke it up by the by the four, by LM, NTLM, oh. NV5, and SHA-1. So, so one of these would take more than a week. Yeah, so the two big ones were the ND 5 and NTLM. Those were 3.6 terabytes. The SHA-1s was 1.3 terabyte, and the LM was... Uh, like 300 something gigs. So, so now you can crack any of those hashes super fast, right? Right. So right. now NTLM means you can crack Windows hashes, right? Yep. 
So have you tried, like, can you do like a 12 character random password or something? Um, I, I'm trying it, like testing it here and there. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm still adding more stuff into this. So if anybody wants to, to copy, they can. Uh, yeah. including where to get the tables and do that process. But the, the big thing was you need to have a lot of storage. For yeah. This well, you know, I know um, there are a couple of instructors. I think Ming does every year. He puts out a bunch of hashes to crack and some of them are like really hard. So mm -hmm. yeah, be good to see. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, my, my next year project is going to be to put a bunch of GPUs together for Hashcat. Yeah. Yeah. That would seem like the other part of this you need. Yeah. Yep. Well, good. That's that's next year when I have a big enough budget. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And so here's this Orion. You know, I wanted to do this, but this stuff appears to be proprietary. It is proprietary. So, uh, of course, everyone's now focused on uh, Solar Wind Orion. Uh, it's under a microscope right now, um, and sure enough, they found an API authorization bypass. Um, doesn't seem to be that powerful, but it's still, you know, a bug. Uh, that will let you do some things that that you're not really supposed to do. So, yeah, uh, or it with solar winds. It doesn't give you like administrative rights or anything. No, nope, it lets you run um, stuff like script resource, uh, skip some uh, 18n path info. It's it's oh, right there. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. You can just yeah run some things you normally can't can't run. It's not a remote code execution bug. Yeah, but, of course. Now the actual. Poison malware from the Russians, that's real code execution, right? Yes, yes. But you'd have to like poison DNS to take over one of the official domains or something. I, I mean, I suppose you could take over the Russian <laughs> malware in like a double double yeah. hack. Yeah. Why not? Well, I assume it wouldn't be that hard. You just yeah. have to have a server on the, one of those domains on like your local network and then give it commands the way the Russians did. That would be pretty awesome, but um, I don't know if you can get a legal copy of the stuff. Anyway. All right, because of course my first thought is, can I put one of these in the cloud and let people practice hacking it? And <laughs> apparently not that easy, but it would be awesome. Mm -hmm. so this one I thought was pretty great. The Dunning-Kruger effect, I've heard about this for a long time. And it turns out it's all garbage. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a mistake. The original Dunning-Kruger effect was that dumb people are so dumb they don't even know how dumb they are, which is something everybody has applied liberally all of, over the world. But it turns out that it's just garbage. This is the original Dunning-Kruger thing. And what you do is you measure people. How, how well do you think you know something? Then you give them a test to see how well they really know it. Then he breaks it up into the quartiles, the bottom 25%, the next 25%, the next, and the top 25%. And he gets these four dots. And this is the perceived ability. And this is the actual ability. And it turns out that this is not a valid statistical test. I hadn't thought about it, but he made up this quartile thing. That's not normal. He should have used like an F test or a T test or something where the statistics are known. And if you just take random numbers, randomly generated, you get this shape. It is an artifact of this quartile stuff. And so this is not from real humans. This is from computers randomly rolling dice where you have an equal chance of overestimating or underestimating your ability. And I think the point is down here, there's more room to overestimate than to underestimate. So the number is higher. <laughs> Something that simple is what's going on. So this thing which spawned decades of speculation is garbage. It reminds me when I did human vision research, there was this thing called the, the partial report superiority where you have people guess numbers that only appear briefly on the screen and it turns out that if you get them to only read one row, they can read it with like 80% accuracy. But if you ask them to read all, all 16 numbers on a bingo card, they only get like 10% accuracy. So they had these complicated models. And all it is after like 40 years of psychological research is the after image on your retina that you can still see for a second. <laughs> so you have one second where the card is still visible in your eye to read it. And that's enough time to read four letters, but not more. But there were all these miles of research done, assuming that it was a deep cognitive thing. Anyway, so I thought this is pretty interesting, uh, kicking over somebody's uh, sandcastle, the, the whole world of psychology and sociology has been building their stuff on for years. Oops. Well, you know, it's really, the thing about statistics, it's really easy to get confused and see something that is not there, you know? You really should use careful statistical tests that 
they were all established. Anyway, Amazon gift cards. Yeah, so uh, something good to pay attention to during, especially in the holiday season. Um, essentially, uh, this is, there's a pretty big campaign targeting um, users in uh, US and Europe uh, where it starts off with a phishing campaign and the attackers send you a, a email that says, um, oh, you received a Amazon gift card, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, they have like three different attack vectors that all end up accomplishing the same thing where uh, they get you to either download something or click a dirty link and um, then uh, send you a, a Trojan for your trouble that's just uh, purpose built for stealing your banking credentials and stuff like that. So, um, and, and as far as I could tell, this is uh, probably gonna affect only Windows users, but um, yep. good, good to pay attention to, uh, especially uh, because a lot of these phishing emails are starting to look really good. I mean, to the point that they uh, can easily fool people who might know better otherwise. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of money in it. I've seen a lot of bad ones, but I've seen some really, really good phishing emails. Yeah. All right, and anti-ransomware. I, I hope these guys come up with something good. Me too. I thought there was already a anti-ransomware coalition, but I guess I was wrong. Uh, this number of companies coming together, I just like you, I hope that they come up with something good that we can all use, like best practices. You know how we always talk about what, what are best practices that we can tell others to, uh, for them to use. And I'm hoping that this group does come up with something that, that is applicable everywhere. We yeah, need something right. simple, like the OWASP top 10 or something. We need right. something we can just tell people, do this. Right. Something that we can easily teach and easily articulate to yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, I hope I hope they manage to come up with a simple countermeasure because it is ridiculous. The current situation, everybody getting hit with ransomware all the time. Mm -hmm. It's gotten to where, you know, I listen to security now and he apologizes. I, we're not going to talk about ransomware this week. Let it happen again. I know everyone's tired of hearing it, but everybody's getting hit again. <laughs> we wouldn't get hit so often if people just stopped paying the damn ransomware people. This is why it's... But you, but, and I've talked to guys that are consultants and they say, you always pay the ransom. Who are you kidding? The fact is they hire you, they say we're in trouble. And the cheapest answer for the individual company is always to pay the ransom. So everybody does. And I know in the grand scheme of things, you wish they wouldn't. But I remember, this is like when, when people kidnap you in like Mexico and stuff, and they hold you hostage, people pay the ransom to get their family member back. It's the same thing. You might say, no, 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 don't pay the ransom. But in each individual case, they say, are you out of your mind? I'm paying the ransom. <laughs> it's a problem, the tragedy of the commons, you know, the individual good is opposed to the global good. There's your, anyway. Anyway, anyway yeah, speaking of global good, uh, let's yeah. talk about bicycles and bicycling for a second. Yeah. Um, so I was about to, so I, I, I'm not, I was, I am about to move. Um, and I was thinking uh, about ways to get around outside the city. And I thought, well, maybe a bicycle, but you know, we really don't have the infrastructure, you know, for to make biking safe anywhere. And it turns out that this is a big issue in, in 2020, people are riding bikes a lot more. Um, and I imagine this is going to be a, an upward trend. Um, uh, as we move forward, and, and a lot of cities and a lot of munici municipalities do not have the proper uh, infrastructure to handle these bikes coming onto the road. You know, they don't have the bike lanes. They don't have, you know, safe places for people to ride bikes. You know, alongside pedestrians and stuff like that. And it, it's becoming a really big issue now. Um, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that these car companies, for a long time, were basically dictating to uh, to cities, you know, how to, how to build their infrastructure. Uh, I mean, there was a time when it was really debated whether or not the automotive industry should be funding highways uh, or just auto manufacturers in general. But of course they lobbied Congress and they said, no, no, it, this is going to be a public works project and it's going to be about our cars. 
you know, not about, you know, serving the public. Um, and this is what happens when we, when a lot of money goes into making government decisions. Essentially, you end up with infrastructure that's not, uh, that, that caters to, um, caters to the profits of, of a single industry that has the money to, you know, lobby, but, but does not cater to the needs of the rest of the population. Yep. Government corruption. This is a, one of our many problems of government corruption. Absolutely. Um, in fact, our lack, a lot of people say, oh, public transit is terrible and I would never want public transit, but that's by design. Yeah. Um, that is absolutely by design. Uh, automotive manufacturers, we used, to have, we used to have great public transportation in the United States and companies like Ford and General Motors uh, came in and said, no, no, you, you should dismantle. They actually took over like bus companies and like in, uh, intentionally made the bus companies go under so that people would be forced to buy their cars. I mean, this is all by design. Yep, it's like cigarettes and mm -hmm. corn syrup and stuff. I know that yeah. I, I used to be big in the San Francisco Bicycling Coalition and they talk about how in Amsterdam, they have a special lane separated by like a curb. So you're not out there with the cars. Right. That's, yeah. Everybody can casually ride their bike. And, you know, we just don't do it here. You're out there with the cars, which looks dangerous. Although I must say, I commuted a year, for a decade or two decades more on bike. And I was always worried about cars and the cars never hurt me. I, you know, I always got hurt by hurting myself. Right. Uh, just falling off the bike was my main risk, but I'm really a paranoid, cautious guy. There are the bike messengers out there just driving right through traffic, and they're probably going to get hurt by a car. Well, but the cars are actually not that big a problem in San Francisco, where there's a lot of bikes. I don't know. I, I have to beg to differ because I used to commute by bike a lot, and um, I saw what finally kind of soured me on doing it was seeing uh, one too many just horrific uh, accident, uh, by cyclists, car accidents, um, oh. in the city, especially, um, especially, um, in the, when you're making the transition from like mission to Soma, uh, there's a lot of really bad areas there, um, which are super, just super unsafe. Oh, so what wow. I'm hearing is flying cars for everyone. Well, I well, I think I think to, to tie this back to hacking and computers in general, in the early 20th century, when all this stuff was going down, essentially, where we were designing the, the roads um, and all this government corruption started taking place, uh, General Motors, Ford, um, Chrysler, et cetera, those were the Googles, those were the Amazons, those were the Apples of the time. Yeah, you know, you wanted to work in those places. They were the big new industries. They were making the new high tech products, these automobiles that everyone was going to own, um, and they grew really fast. And they got a lot, a lot of government influence. And we're seeing some of the same same issues crop up today with with Google and Facebook and and our modern giant uh, companies. And it, and it's going to end up hurting us, you know, eighty years down the road, ninety years down the road. Yeah, yeah, you're right. This is this is what Richard Nixon said. He said, you know, the only purpose of a president is foreign policy. Domestic policy is run by the corporations. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, here's one which I certainly am generally on board with. You're going to probably require a vaccine passport and it's probably going to be an app, but you're probably going to have to prove that you took the vaccine before you can ride like airplanes and probably buses and before you can get in buildings with jobs and stuff and, you know, that makes sense to me. I think there'll be the usual bunch of angry people screaming that they have the right not to take the vaccine, but I would certainly like to think that all the people on a crowded airplane have been forced to take the vaccine. Anyway, we're headed for this. And then there'll be a market for counterfeit vaccine certificates and stuff. What if they just like throw it into your, uh, your driver's license or something like that? Yeah, well, they already have them in, in uh, China and India. They have this thing and I already saw somebody who showed how to hack it to make it say you're green when you're not green. Of course. Right, right. Of course. Of course. That will of course be a feature. And all the companies like IBM and everybody are making these apps that are supposedly preserving your privacy and stuff, but I'm sure there will be all sorts of entertaining uh, flaws and disasters. I'm really trying to figure out how it's okay to have people flying in planes at full capacity right now. Like that, I, there's, I don't have enough cognitive dissonance 
to be able to understand how we need to social distance, yet somehow it's okay to shove 300 people squished up against one another into a tiny metal tube for hours on end. I've seen these articles that say it's safer than anything because all that air is replaced like every two minutes or something. Uh, but, but I don't know if any of that is really true. That, that seems like propaganda to me, but. Uh, right, who's putting that out? Is that the airlines? Hmm. That, that's what it seems like. Well, like, yes. sure, sure, it's fine. Don't tank our industry, please. It's fine to fly. And I, I keep getting all these like, solicitations from the airlines in my email like oh you haven't flown with us say save big on some tickets right now yeah, I, like, oh, it's funny. I got i got one speaking of which i got one like either yesterday or today i'm like jet blue going hey 20 dollars from uh, san jose to long beach like uh-huh that's cute but no you know, this reminds me of like when Kevin Mitnick was giving a talk. He said, you can join my plan at zero dollars up front and zero dollars a minute, but there's a big cost at the end. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. even if, you you know, yes, I do buy that there are air purification systems on planes that are that are very efficient, but that's not the only issue here. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, even if everyone's wearing a mask every second, of the flight, which isn't going to happen, especially with little kids and people yeah. like eating and drinking and stuff and yeah. needing to use the bathroom and running into all these TSA uh, people and standing in line and being in the airports and eating and drinking in the airports. And it's just like, okay, the beach is closed. I haven't been able to go to the beach all year. No going to the beach, but it's okay to get on a plane and fly six, eight hours and go see grandma. I, I, I just, I don't get it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, that's why I, I'm not doing any of that until I have the vaccine, you know? <laughs> and even then it's like, uh, once we have the vaccine, we still don't know whether we can be carriers or not. Well, I think we'll know by the time we get it, we're not going to get the vaccine until June. And by then they will know from all these early adopters, the details, but we'll see what happens. Right now, it looks like they're not going to successfully roll out the vaccine. Maybe we're not going to get it till November. So <laughs> we'll no see. Surprise there. Anyway, I'm. Uh, we're all going to be hiding for a good part of the next year, anyway. I guess. So the thing to do is hack more satellites, and otherwise stay out of trouble. All right. Any more comments? All right. I'm going to stop this recording. <laughs>